You are listening to Backstage Pass Podcast, hosted by Hannah Trigwell and brought to you by Dylan. Hello, Bob James. Hello. Hi, Hannah. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Extra, well, considering the, the circumstances, extremely well. So um, I can't really complain, apart from it's raining. But hey, that's the, the great British summer. I know you best as an artist manager because you were my artist manager. I had that privilege. That's correct, yes. It was awesome. And I think it's fairly unusual for an artist and a former manager to stay friends. But we've always been really good friends. So this... yeah. It was always going to be this way, which is awesome. Absolutely. For the viewers and the listeners who don't know your background, there's a lot more to what you do than just artist management. So give us a rundown. Okay, so we've got about three hours for my life history. Um, (laughs) Sometimes it feels like that as I go into the spiel. Um, (laughs) Basically, first things first, I I used to say I'm not a creator. And then I actually realised I am a creator by creating a different way. Um, The difference is I'm not a musician. I tried very hard to play instruments and I just wasn't very good at it. But I actually learned that I could make money and have success through playing other people's music. Uh, And that's how I started. I started DJing. I then built up a network of DJs all over the country. I was part of the scene. I, I, I became a sort of chairman of the DJ associations and just kept on putting myself forward and was visible in the industry. Um, And then on the back of that, I got the opportunity to start doing club promotions, sending music out to DJs. Um, And I went, yeah, absolutely. Why not? And uh, the very first records I worked, I actually had four number ones in a row through Jive Bunny, believe it or not, through a a, a cartoon rabbit. But that was enough to get me started. And then that company went on and became probably the biggest independent promotion and marketing company in the UK, doing club, radio, TV, um, college promotion, and and then eventually that you know we had sort of thirty six staff and a multi million pound turnover, but all started because I kept on putting myself forward for stuff. Going, yep, I can do it. Yep, I can do it. And uh, then on the back of that, we got the opportunity to go into management, and we set up a management arm, and we were managing Mystique at that time. We were managing singer uh, songwriters and also professional songwriters. Um, such as deep people like DK Music and who were fantastic and had loads and loads of success. And then that just kept on going. And then eventually I moved out of promotion and went into management. Um, and then my journey always sort of just keeps consi- no, continuing. I'm still DJing all these years later, still putting myself forward for stuff. Um, and then sort of became quite frustrated, I think, with why... Uh, in artist management, and this isn't reflection on you because you're a pleasure to work with, but we've had uh, <laughs> quite a few situations over the years where the yeah. biggest problem was actually the artists themselves um, right. getting in their own way and this self destructive mm. I just couldn't work it out. So I uh, started doing lots of research. Um, I also have always, ever since I was young, had a bit of a sort of an overactive mind. Um, I always had a bit of an anxious mind, sort of thinking about every possibility, plan A, plan B, plan C which is brilliant for management, but crap if you want to get a decent night's sleep. Um, <laughs> so, with my, yeah. so with my current partner, um, she actually sort of pointed me in the direction of actually understanding my thoughts. Um, and then I went off and I trained as a mindfulness coach. So I teach people mindfulness now, um, discover things like meditation, um, understanding now how the mind works. And again, putting myself forward, my partner also, she, she trained as a hypnotherapist and we, we, we built a business on the back of that, which, thank goodness we did, is, uh, is doing great guns now. And, and that has now become almost like my focus. But based around helping creative people, because what we've actually done is actually sort of worked out what's going wrong. And it's mm. actually so simple to change. If you fold your arms, let me try this. You fold your arms. Just fold your arms with me. All right. Now unfold them. Now fold them again. Now unfold them. Now fold them again. Okay, now every single time you fold your arms exactly the same way. Now try and fold them the other way around. (laughs) Okay. Uh, How would that even go? I don't actually know how to do that. Like that? Yeah. 
Now, but it feels weird, doesn't it? So immediately yeah, your subconscious is saying, no, <laughs> go back, do it the way we always do it. And that's actually, yeah. that's, that's what's happening with artists. You get into a habit of doing something mm. where you're safe. But someone comes along, such as maybe a manager or says, so, no, 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 you've got to do something which is outside your comfort zone. Immediately you're going, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do that. The future has, hasn't happened. And yet the majority of our thoughts are based on the future going, oh, this could happen. That's going to happen. And we project and nothing, the way we, the way we project it, nothing ever happens the way we project it. So the only thing yeah, that actually okay. matters is now and the decision you make now. Um, Annette Brown, who was one of my uh, mentors who taught me with mindfulness, one of the things that she used and I picked up on and I thought was great was the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. Ooh, I like that. Change it. False. I'm going to write that down, actually. That's a good one. Yeah. False, false evidence, evidence appearing, appearing real. real. And that is all that fear is. All right. We okay. are scared of something happening. Does it ever happen? No. But that's your subconscious going, what if there's a saber toothed tiger there? So the default position will always be not to do something. Yeah. And that is the and problem that most artists have. They choose not to yeah. do something. Part of the conversation that we had a number of years ago when I was, I had all these songs. I remember having all these songs ready um, and uh, and I was at your house and we were just talking oh. about what we're going to do and you were like, do an album. And I was like, well, I can't do an album. I'm just an independent artist. I should be putting out singles and EPs. I can't do an album. And you were like, why Why can't you do an album? Like it was going to it was gonna cost me financially and cost me a lot of time. But if I just went to to do it, then it would get done. Mm-hmm. And then we did it. But it's like what you say, like that fear of the unknown almost. I think that's what struck me at that time. And also you had the fear of being judged. The fear yeah. of people saying, I don't like this. But again, <laughs> yeah. put it into perspective. Have you listened to the first album that Pink Floyd ever made? No. It's just a series so. of experimental noises. There is no melody. It's all over the place. It's sort of literally <laughs> Faustian sort of crazy stuff going off. But okay. Dark Side of the Moon wasn't their first album. That evolved mm. through the process. Yeah. So again, with artists, I always say, well, what have you got to lose? Because you know something, if people don't like it, what you should be saying, and I know this sounds really weird, you should be saying, thank you. Thank you for telling me it's not good enough. Thank you Mm. for giving me the incentive to do better. Thank you for making me go away and learn better recording, better production, the learn that it is important to get the album to flow. When you see that criticism, Mm. right, Remember, failure equals feedback. So failure, well, every time I've ever failed in my life, I've gone brilliant. Why? Because I'm not going to make that mistake again. So yeah. artists need to be making mistakes. They need to be putting crap out, making the mistake, learning from that and getting better. Yeah. Are you saying that the album was crap? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good try. Yeah, I to- Good try. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I totally agree with you I think a lot of artists get stuck in that um you know for me as well I've had situations where I've put songs out years ago and and likes them at the time and now feel like what I'm doing is different to that and you almost want to draw a line in the sand and start afresh sometimes when you've got a new project or a new song or a new album whatever um but that's the whole journey isn't it and if I hadn't have put out that song that I now I'm not so fond of then I wouldn't have this song that I am so fond of. And it's like, yeah, it's like what you say. If you if you don't do it, even if you're going to fail, then you never get to the next point. So, so again, like here's another sort of scenario. Um, and, and I've used this scenario. But what if, say an artist is, I mean, an RN does, doesn't want to put the single out because they're afraid it's going to fail and it's mission critical. The record label has said, this has got to work, otherwise you're dropped. So they get yeah. paralyzed by fear. So what happens is they overproduce, they rethink it, and maybe that song which had that amazing feel when it first created it gets sanitized to the point of not being recognizable through fear, and it sounds like everything else in the charts. The originality has been knocked out because they're worried it won't get played on radio. 
Mm-hmm. But what happens in that situation is their very fear is attracted to them. The negativity attracts more negativity to them. So one, it probably won't work because they're, they're so frightened. So what the first yeah. thing you've got to do is to put out what you believe in and stand by it and be grateful for the opportunity to be able to put that music out and to be heard. Now, yeah. the other thing is, what if you put that music out and it fails completely? Is it life or death? No. You're not put to a firing squad, but what if <laughs> the failure of that record means that you then start making a bit of a joke about it? The next thing, within five years, you're that comedian going around in arenas talking about your life as an independent recording artist, telling stories and having people rolling over in laughter, and you're now one of the most successful comedians on the planet playing to stadiums. These things happen in such a weird way as well, don't they? Mm-hmm. Well, look, you know, if we hadn't met, all right, if I'm yeah. falling in love with your music when we first uh, first met and we wanted to work together, we hadn't gone through that journey, we wouldn't be doing this now. And we don't yeah, know where true. this is going to lead. You don't know where your future is going to lead. Music will always be part of it. But, mm. you know, uh, you know I, I hated education as a child and yet I teach a degree and I do <laughs> yes. public speaking. Yeah. I never foresaw that. If anybody said to me, 20 years ago, Bob, you're going to be preaching well-being and doing mindfulness and meditating and things like that. I would have laughed myself stupid and just gone, (laughs) you're mad. Whatever you're smoking, pass it over here because it's just (laughs) crazy. Um, But now I am. And and we always used to joke, and I'm I'm from Brighton and, well, I Sort of, no, down south, good old southern, lived yeah. in Brighton. I always used to take the mickey out of Hannah living up north. Where am I living? <laughs> up north. Most people nowadays mm. in social media, which is really damaging, surround themselves with an echo chamber. They block people who have different points of view to them and only yeah. have people that agree with them. Therefore, there is no perspective. There is no discourse. There is no critical thinking. So if you're not making £100,000 on streaming income by your PRS, MCPS income. Maybe a song's not good enough. Could that be a possibility? You could don't ever say that to an artist. <laughs> I know. And that's the difficult thing, isn't it? All right. Um, yeah. Is actually saying, well, but then surely part of that is if someone says that to you, it's the whole failure equals feedback. It's like, you know, saying thank you mm. for telling me that because you've now given yeah. me the incentive to go out there and write better songs. And that comes back down to the event your response to that event creates a new outcome. Yeah. So you're changing the outlook. You're saying, thank you. Just, I'm so grateful that you have been so honest to tell me my song sucks rather than allowing me <laughs> to continue to put out these crap songs and then I'm sitting there festering saying it's the whole world's fault other than my own. And now you've pointed out that I am a crap songwriter. So do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of my ego. I'm going to go and collaborate with a professional songwriter. I'm going to really learn my craft and work Mm. out what's good. And I'm going to write an amazing song. I'm going to have the success that is waiting for me because I know I can do this. I believe in that. And thank you for helping me. You have (laughs) the ability to have whatever you desire. All you've got to do is choose it. One of the last questions that I wanted to ask you was, what is your track of the week? Uh, the ID remix of Age of Love. Okay. Which was sort of an old jam and spoon classic on RS record label, Belgian sort of techno classic. And there's an energy about it, but what well, I don't know what it is. You know, it's not like singer songwriter. It doesn't connect to me lyrically because there are mm. no lyrics. Um, but what it does is something about the emotion that triggers something in me and I'll dance around in me boxer shorts to it and have a great time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> There's a thought to leave you with, actually, which is really not good. Yeah, thank you. My final question is, what is the best lesson you've learned in your career so far? Um, Having the humility to trust someone else and to to listen to what other people have to say rather than thinking I'm always right. Yeah, it's a good one. So, and and the thing is, when you you realise that and you you become a willing student and you are willing to listen, there is so much that you can learn. And it's just, I never, ever stop learning. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass. Backstage Pass.